start by asking yourself the question who or what is it that knows or is aware of my experience? and allow this question to invite the mind away from the objects of experience in an objectless direction, inwards or selfwards <coughs> to their subjective knower. Don't try to find the knower as an object of experience. Just as the I is too close to itself to be able to turn around and look at itself. just as the sun is too close to itself in order to turn round and illuminate itself. So the knower is too close to itself to be able to turn round and know itself in subject-object relationship. The knower can never be an object of experience or an object of attention. It is a relaxing of the attention, not a focusing of the attention. The sinking of attention, not a stretching of the attention. Just as John Smith doesn't have to do anything special in order to know himself. He knows himself just by being himself. 
so the knower, pure awareness, doesn't have to do anything, doesn't have to direct the light of its attention in any direction in order to know itself. It knows itself simply by being itself. This is why Ramana Maharshi said, to be, simply to be, is the highest meditation. common name for that which knows or is aware of experience is I. <coughs> I know my thoughts. I am aware of feelings and sensations. I perceive the world. So another way of asking the question, who or what is it that knows or is aware of my experience, is simply, who or what am I? It's the same question. unless and until the question who or what am I is answered. Nothing can be known for certain about reality. The reason that scientists after all these centuries are still uncertain about the nature uh, of the universe is because they are still uncertain about the nature of themselves. They think they can investigate the nature of the universe without first knowing the reality of themselves. That's why the Sufis say, whosoever knows their self knows their Lord. Whosoever knows what I essentially am, knows what the ultimate reality of the universe essentially is. Therefore there can be no higher knowledge than to know the nature of I.
begin with, it seems as if I am a located subject of experience. that lives in and therefore shares the limits and destiny of the body. But if we come close to the experience of I, that is, if it comes close to itself, We don't find a, a separate, limited, located subject of experience. We find an aware openness in which the body and all experience appears. be knowingly this aware openness. This fully aware emptiness. It's like looking at a watercolour painting of a landscape from a distance. It seems that the highlights in the painting, for instance the sunlight reflected on the water, are part of the painting. But when we go up to the painting, we see that the highlights are those parts that the painter has left unpainted. It is just the white paper. The experience I is like the little patch of white paper. It seems to be an object in experience. But when we go up close to it, that is when it comes close to itself, it discovers that it is not an object of experience or an object in experience. It is the white paper upon which all experience is painted. knowingly the white paper 
upon which all experience is painted. The knowledge I is a hint or a trace in experience of the white paper behind experience. It is what the poet Shelley called the white radiance of eternity. The knowledge I is a trace of the white radiance of eternity within experience. Follow that thread, follow the thread of I, or I am. It is the portal through which the mind has direct access to its reality. That is why in many religions, I is the divine name. be knowingly the white radiance of eternity. See that all experience is a coloring of yourself. But don't allow any experience to tarnish or stain yourself. white paper upon which all experience is painted is like an aware space aware openness, a knowing emptiness. Not so much upon with, but rather within which all experience arises. It is your aware emptiness that allows the fullness of experience to arise.
be knowingly this aware openness. This fully aware emptiness. experience is a play of yourself within yourself. So unlike the watercolour painting where the paint is applied on the paper from the outside, experience is more like a hologram. Where the objects that appear in the space of the hologram are made of the space of the hologram. They are made of the space and appear in the space. now all be able to say I was present on the day when Rupert upgraded the metaphor of the self-aware screen to the self-aware hologram. <laughs> <laughs> from the perspective of one of the 
characters in the hologram. The experience seems to comprise a multiplicity and diversity of objects and others, known by a separate subject of experience. In other words, experience seems to be divided into two essential ingredients, self and other. But from the point of view of the hologram itself, experience is one seamless, intimate, infinite whole, in which no objects or selves ever come into actual existence. from the perspective of the hologram, from the perspective of this fully aware emptiness. The experience is a, a flow of itself within itself. nothing other than itself ever comes into existence. As such, mind or experience is the activity of awareness. No object or self ever acquires a status of its own. It is the apparently separate subject of experience 
the character in the hologram that reifies experience and makes experience into a multiplicity and diversity of objects. For the foreigners amongst us, to reify comes from the Latin word res, meaning a thing. So, when I say the separate subject of experience reifies, experience, making it seem to be a multiplicity and diversity of objects. I mean the separate subject of experience, the finite mind, conceptualizes things, objectifies, or makes into a collection of objects, makes experience into a collection of objects. But objects are only such from the illusory point of view of the separate subject of experience. From the point of view of the hologram, from the point of view of this fully aware emptiness, there are no real subjects or objects. Jane is just a temporary limitation of Mary's mind. She has no status of her own, nor do any of the objects or people <coughs> she encounters on the streets of Paris. They are all made out of the same intimate, infinite, indivisible substance. feel life like a series of activities rather than a series of objects and entities. That is, a series of activities, uh, thinking, imagining, feeling, sensing and perceiving, rather than a series of objects, that is, thoughts, images, feelings, sensations and perceptions. In other words, see life like a piece of music rather than a series of sculptures. <coughs> Don't objectify anything. Don't 
downgrade the infinite into the finite. This is what William Blake meant when he said every bird that cuts the airy way is an immense world of delight. Yes, sorry, every bird that cuts the airy way is an immense world of delight enclosed by the five senses. It is sense perception, that is the finite mind, that encloses reality, that shrinks the immense world of delight into an apparent object. the bird, the object, is not a thing in itself, it is a reification or an objectification of the mind. It is the mind that superimposes its own limits on reality and makes it appear, makes it appear as a finite object or a series of finite objects. just as one who wears orange-tinted glasses will forget that he is doing so and will believe that the world itself is orange. So the finite mind forgets that it is seeing reality through the prism of its own limitations and will believe that those limitations belong to reality. <coughs> of course, 
course, the finite mind is itself a part of reality. It is infinite consciousness itself that assumes the form of the finite mind and appears to it and appears to itself as the world. In other words, as the Sufis say, the world is the face of God. Matter is what infinite consciousness or God's infinite being looks like when viewed through the prism of the finite mind. content of the hologram is always changing. The space of the hologram never changes. As experience, you are always changing. As aware openness, you are never changing. Knowing that we never change, we can allow experience to always change.
knowing that as this aware openness we stand to gain nothing nor lose anything from any particular experience. We cease having an agenda with experience. There is no need to meditate. What would this aware openness gain by meditating that it does not already possess? No need to control or direct the mind. No need to stop thinking. No need to change negative feelings into positive. No need to desire anything or fear anything. No need to accept anything or reject anything. No need to judge anything or complain about anything. This aware openness is self-fulfilled. It is always at rest in itself. Experience doesn't have to be a certain way for it to rest in itself. depressed, it is resting in itself. There is a moment of joy, it is resting in itself. Or if we are just walking down the street or drinking tea, it is resting in itself. is nowhere for this aware openness to go and nothing for it to do for wherever it goes or whatever it does it only finds more of itself or rather it only finds itself There can never be more of itself or less of itself than there always is. In other words, it moves from fullness to fullness, from perfection to perfection.
don't allow experience to persuade you that you are anything other than this aware openness. Inherently empty of objects, but full to the brim with yourself. Luminous, pristine, unharmable. indestructible, imperturbable, <coughs> inherently and unconditionally fulfilled. Utterly intimate with all seeming things and at the same time free or independent of them. Needing nothing but embracing everything. Taking the shape, <coughs> taking the shape from moment to moment of all forms of experience. But never ceasing to be or know or love itself alone. 